Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And before I start, I, I have a follow-up uh, comment on the last question. Uh, because when we, uh, when we talk about the uncertainty, uh, like you can compute for map uh, point solution, you, you, you're talking about the uncertainty that is derived from the projections. This is a, a, a frequentist uh, understanding of uncertainty. What we talk about is the uncertainty that is uh, Bayesian, which are basically different things. Okay, so you would compare apples with oranges, sort of. Uh, yeah. um, so um, I'm going to start with uh, giving you a little motivation in a why um, uh, this kind of methods, uh, uh, we develop this kind of methods. Uh, so um, the PED is, is very tricky to reconstruct because we have this very yield pose problem and then um, every construction is uh, soiled with this uh, problem of the uh, noise versus resolution trade-offs. Um, and then it depends on the data uh, using some priors we can um, well, basically, we should use different priors for different uh, strengths of the data, and we don't. And what happens is that uh, when those uh, images are generated, especially in imaging of the, uh, I took the example of the imaging of the basal ganglia in neuroimaging, because we are interested in very small structures, then uh, we run into those problems, because depending how, how where we are on, the, on this uh, trade-off curve, we're going to have different uh, reconstructions. So what I've, what I've done actually for this talk, I, uh, when I was preparing the slides, I, I, I googled um, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, papers that people actually use this and give you some examples. Uh, so for example, in, in one of those papers, you know, people uh, compare uh, this image to this image and you can clearly see that the background is completely different. You know, so uh, it's quite obvious that uh, you know, th these are comparisons of images that they are on the different, uh, different uh, positions on this curve. Uh, and this is sort of extreme example, you know, there is an overlaid image on the, um, on the mar and you can see that the, the PED image is extremely noisy, but the investigators, you know, they'll do what, uh, uh, what they can do <laughs> with this, uh, still try to get some inference uh, from the image. It's very difficult. Um, so um, uh, what can help is this uh, multimodality imaging where, where for example, in, in PED MR we have, um, um, uh, let's say perfectly co-registered co images, and then using the structural information that has very high resolution, we can, for example, identify regions, um, group of pixels that uh, uh, that that they are interested in in getting some quantitative values from. Uh, so that could be, you know, the put on uh, in general the striata, striata, uh, striatum structures. Um, so um, so the idea is that well. You know, sometimes maybe we don't even want to show the PET image to the users. Uh, just let's get the numbers out of what we are interested in. Uh, for example, we, when you investigate uh, heterogeneity in the putamen or, 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 or maybe when the patient uh, progress of the disease in, or, uh, in time or uh, effect of the drugs and so on. We just want to compare those numbers uh, that they are coming out. Um, so this is, this, is, this is again one of the examples, you know, so the investigators, you know, they, they compare uh, measurements, for example, some ratio of activities uh, between the uh, volume of interest and some reference regions, and and provide the numbers. But we don't really know, you know, is, is this is this a is this difference is, is it really there, or is maybe this is just as it happened, you know, for this scan, um, and and then because there is no no error bars, um, and it's it's in general in, in iterative reconstruction to get error bars is is, is it's a very difficult, you know, the idea of error bars is uh, a long time in, but uh, we still don't have a really good method to do this. So, uh, so what I, uh, what I try to um, convince you to is, well, maybe let's do something like that, that, you know, if we have multimodality images and we're interested in some quantitative values of some small structures, let's define some group of pixels that uh, we are interested in and then um, obtain you know, the distribution, probability distribution, what the real activity is in those, uh, in those regions. And this is not a region image reconstruction per se because we don't really reconstruct uh, just one image. Not, not the, it's not a point estimate. You uh, estimate those uh, distributions. What's, what's a very nice property of the distribution is that uh, they, they give a lot of insights because now we can, for example, answer the question, um, 
is uh, uh, activity in Caudata uh, higher than, let's say, 1.3 uh, activity in Pluton? And, th and the answer is actually in probability. So the, probability, uh, the, the, the method like that would give the answer in probability. So that's the, that's the e and this kind of probabilities can be estimated when we do this uh, fully Bayesian reconstruction. And by fully Bayesian, I mean uh, that we reconstruct entire distribution, posterior distribution, not only some point estimation. Yeah. Um, so, um, so this is this is the, the the point that I just I just made. Um, the other way of thinking about the pro posterior distribution is that we we find images that may have happened and that which generated uh, the data that we've seen. So we've seen only one, one set of data, but there are many possible images that could have created it. Um, and so this, this entire distribution of those images, this is our posterior distribution. Uh, it is a very high dimensional uh, probability distribution uh, because you know, if we voxelize the image, then uh, one, one voxel is one dimension. So it's a, there is a lot of dimensions here. Um, and, and I want to make this point, you know, a lot of time we, we talk about the Bayesian reconstruction, but we think uh, map, so it's a point estimate. So that's, that's so I want to clearly differentiate that what I'm talking about here and, and what we are talking in this session is that we are trying to, uh, to actually find that entire posterior distribution. Um, now, um, if we have this procedural distribution now, it's, it's easy. We just identify voxels that we're interested in, then we marginalize it, and then we have this uh, nice uh, curves that we can compare to. Uh, there is a big problem. How do op we obtain this, right? So as you saw from the previous talk, that's not a straightforward task to do um, with the, uh, when we assume the Poisson statistics. Uh, then alternative is this uh, so-called uh, old origin ensemble algorithm. Uh, that my colleagues and I developed over the years. Um, it uh, it is actually much easier to implement. It's actually pretty trivial to implement, and it provides those distributions. The difference is that uh, uh, this algorithm, the image is not defined in terms of the Poisson uh, activities, but it's defined in terms of how many um, events occurred in the in the each voxel. So it's a, it's a big difference because uh, activity, that's a continuous variable. What uh, uh, I'm talking about here, it's a number of counts. Um, uh, so uh, this, what this algorithm does, it, gener it, it basically uh, extracts those images that possibly could generate the data. And I will show you in a second how to do that. Uh, just uh, for those who haven't seen this, you know, I'm just gonna go very quickly through this algorithm because uh, um, it, it, it's really easy to explain, I think. Um, I, I, uh, I wrote here a uh, produced from 2007 because the history of this that uh, I accidentally discovered it and then struggled for many years to actually explain it uh, in terms of statistics. Um, but, uh, uh, but the algorithm is, is, is quite, uh, it's more than 10 years uh, old now. <laughs> uh, so how it works is that this is, a, this is a, let's say, a PET and there is 16 voxels. And if we detect uh, an event, uh, we, we have LOR that the event could have uh, happened on. Um, and, then, uh, and then if we voxelize the area, you know, we have four voxels that, it, that event could have occurred in. Now, obviously we acquire a lot of those uh, events, so we have many line of responses. Um, and the algorithm is very simple. We, s we start with uh, basically guessing where each event that we detected happened. And the guess is, is random, just on the line of response. Some, somewhere happened somewhere there. And then the algorithm starts by first uh, uh, randomly cho uh, choosing one of the events that we detected, let's say this one. And then we have another random number generator and we generate a new location, candidate location where we want to move it there. So we're basically guessing where actual uh, origin of this uh, uh, event uh, was. Uh, once we generate this new location, we just move that event there. And then we just keep repeating this, uh, randomly get another line of response, another uh, candidate location, and then we move it uh, this, this origin of this event there and so on. Um, so obviously, uh, and just you know, keep repeating it. This is a very fast process. So actual reconstruction is like, like it could be billions of, of moves like that. Uh, but obviously so far it's pretty uh, silly because 
well, there is no rules yet. Uh, uh, and, and, and basically, there is, uh, in order to, to make actually this algorithm meaningful, there is some rules of traffic. So when I was uh, so just bringing this first example, when I was trying to move this event from here to here, what we have is that there is uh, obviously many line of responses that go through that voxel, and many lines of responses that go through this voxel. And it may happen that at this stage of the reconstruction, because it's all linear, there is some number of, uh, of those origin resides in this voxel. And there is some number uh, resides in this voxel. Um, oh, well, I'm very sorry, there is a missing uh, text. It's a Mac uh, PC problem. But basically, the idea is that, uh, that if there is, there is more of those events in here, we always move. And if there is uh, less than, uh, less than uh, the original location, then we move the, with the probability that is equal to the number of uh, voxels in the uh, new location divided by uh, number of, uh, so number of events in this new location divided by number of events in the old location. Um, in this example, it's, it's going to be five because we always add one to it. So two plus one divided by six is five. Um, I'm just gonna skip that because it doesn't work. So, uh, so right now we have this, this is the whole algorithm and we just, just keep uh, iterating it. Uh, and this algorithm actually reaches uh, equilibrium. Equilibrium means that if, if we monitor the number of uh, those origins in each pixel, it's gonna be stable. It's gonna fluctuate, but, but it's gonna be stable over time. It is, so the algorithm converts. Um, it's, 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 I think, you know, I, ho I think I appreciate that this is a very simple way of <laughs> doing, the, doing this. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the proof of convergence and, and uh, um, uh, and 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 and, and, and uh, derivation of this uh, in, in, in our papers. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go into the equations uh, very much, but uh, I just want to show you the uh, the actual uh, likelihood of that of that uh, of that method. Uh, so we have the likelihood. Our image is now C, and C is the number of uh, events that occurred in given voxel. G is the data as usual. Uh, as you see, this, uh, this likelihood is, is pretty nightmarish because of that, of that sum. So uh, there is uh, nothing get, gets canceled in here. Uh, but then uh, we have the, our system matrix and uh, voxel sensitivity and so on. So um, um, what, uh, what the sum is, can you look at this a little bit differently? You know, for, for those um, uh, familiar with, this, uh, with, the, with the reconstruction nucle nuclear, you know, this is equal to Y, which is a complete data, right? So in a way, what, you, uh, what that is, is a sum of all the possible uh, probabilities of all the possible uh, complete data states that are consistent with the, uh, with the measurement. So, uh, so we have number of, uh, uh, number of voxels that are emitted some number of, uh, uh, events, and then we just sum of all the complete data that are consistent with this. Um, the other way of, of thinking about, you know, how uh, the statistics is posed is to consider the uh, consider this. This is a, this is a model of tomography. Uh, it's actually a pretty accurate one. <laughs> so uh, so we have a dartboard, which is our detector, and we have number of uh, dart throwers that throw that throw darts into this uh, into this board. Uh, so our, our, our data is number of hits in each field of that, uh, uh, of the dartboard. Uh, we know that what the probability is that uh, every thrower, when it throws, it hits a given, a given, uh, given field. This is our system matrix. Uh, thrower is a, is a pixel, is a voxel. Uh, so this is actually a very accurate representation of uh, what, what statistics uh, I'm using in those algorithms. Now, very frequently when I talk about this or, or, or write about this, you know, people ask, you know, what about the Poisson? Uh, well, the Poisson is actually uh, pre, it's an approximation uh, of the statistics I'm using because the statistics that, that I'm using is based on the binomial uh, assumption that uh, the number of emissions is, is, uh, is binomial and we can actually pretty easily derive the, the Poisson. So this is a more general uh, statistical model of the data. Um, so, uh, so now uh, the question is, uh, is this actually a practical algorithm? It's actually very practical. The computing time 
uh, compared to the list mode is uh, maybe 10 times longer. So uh, it is m uh, more computationally intensive. But remember what we do here, you know, so we, we don't actually reconstruct it. And I'm going to tell you in a second how, we, how, how I got that. But uh, as the algorithm uh, goes, um, I'm taking a snapshot of how many, how many origins are in a, given in a given voxel. And this is my, one of my sample of my posterior. I can do that thousands of times. Uh, so I took one snapshot and I run algorithm for a million steps, another snapshot and another snapshot and another snapshot. So the reconstruction is the, the actual approximation of the posterior is let's say those thousands of those snapshots. Uh, so this is a general result of that method. Obviously, obviously uh, we can, as I mentioned at the beginning, you can identify the region of interest, compute from those, uh, from those snapshots, those curves, and this is, a, this is a posterior of number of emissions in this uh, region of interest that I uh, identify. But we can also, you know, if you want to uh, really <laughs> image reconstruction, some image, we can also compute the mean of those, uh, of those snapshots, which is the uh, approximation of the mean of the whole, whole posterior. And, and, and this is a comparison. This is the data from the, uh, from the time of flight Philips scanner, um, where we re reconstructed the, uh, the image using the standard uh, maximum likelihood method and, and this mean of those, of, of those snapshots. And I hope you can appreciate you know, that these are very similar as you would expect because this actually uses almost the same statistics because Poisson approximation is almost perfect you know, for the binomial used in imaging. Um, so obviously we expect you know, something that's going to be very similar. But obviously what we have here is that, you know, if, I, if for example, we identify the region of interest here, we not only have some point estimate, but we also have this distribution. So this distribution can be compared between different uh, volume of interest in this image. Um, uh, we can also implement, you know, all the, all the corrections in this algorithm as well. Obviously, as you may imagine, because the alg algorithm is completely uh, different, then those corrections have to have uh, be also different, you know, and, and, but it's possible to do. Um, one thing that, uh, the last thing that I want to mention, this, this is the uh, second to last slide, is that um, when I present this algorithm, I never try to guarantee the agreement of the data, right? So typically with MLEM and, and, and uh, likelihood-based algorithms, we're trying to get the fidelity uh, agreement with the data. This, this is not really done in this algorithm. It's uh, basically implicitly uh, doing this because everything is done in the image in, in the image domain. So, so, so a few take-home points. Um, uh, pr posterior distribution is an option in order to uh, to the reconstruction uh, of the point of the point estimate. Um, uh, once we have this posterior distribution, we can actually derive very interesting uh, insights. We can compare uh, compare to different regions in the image in terms of the probability. Uh, all, the, uh, all the pixel, the voxel correlations are all included in this. It's all taken into account when we actually marginalize this hugely dimensional posterior. Um, and this algorithm is, is, is very efficient uh, considering the, the difficulty of the problem, obviously. Uh, it still, it still uh, requires quite a bit of computing, but, uh, uh, but considering <laughs> what we get out of it, I think it's pretty efficient compared to options. Uh, uh, now, this algorithm is, does, does not have any hyperparameters, right? So, so basically, you know, this, uh, this, this posterior distribution is the only function of uh, how much data we, we acquire and well, what is the geometry of the, our, our scanner that acquire the data. So this is also very nice because now we, we are not dependent on any hyperparameters when we make those uh, quantitative inferences. Um, so I think it's, it, it, it is an alternative to do the quantitation. Um, and basically that's what I would like to finish with. Thank you. <laughs>